Health Brain Injury Training and Services Project Director here at the Association. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. Because of limited time, we ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. During the Q&A session, questions can be submitted via the question text box. The text box option should be visible to you on the GoToWebinar toolbar on your desktop. If you are having trouble viewing this option, please contact Citrix Tech Support at 1-800-263-6317. Again, that number is 1-800-263-6317. This number should be visible on your toolbar as well. Our speaker will do his best to answer questions in the order that they are received. Any questions he is unable to address may be submitted via email to the association. We will be recording this webinar session and plan to post it, along with the presentation slides, to our website, www.biaenys.org. Information about contacting the association and viewing the webinar will be provided in a follow-up email after the presentation has ended. My contact information will also be included in those follow-up messages. Before I turn the microphone over to George, let us begin with a quick poll question to see who is in our audience today. I will be launching the poll now. Please take a moment to answer the question. give you about five more seconds to answer. All right. I'm closing the poll now and sharing the results. It looks like the majority of you um, are healthcare professionals or caseworkers. Um, we also have a lot of individuals who are affiliated with brain injury programs. Um, and we have some individuals representing the, uh, the school setting as well. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, I love seeing a diverse group. It's always great to see. And I want to thank you all again for your participation uh, and for helping to spread the word about our monthly webinars. Your support is truly appreciated. It is with sincere pleasure that I introduce our presenter for today, George Vister. George developed hydrocephalus from concussions while playing for the San Francisco 49ers. In 2010, he launched the Visker Group, a traumatic brain injury consulting organization, and has spoken all over the country on coping mechanisms for TBI and successful recovery treatment. He has survived nine brain surgeries and 32 years of grand mal seizures. George, good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Welcome, everybody. All right, George, I have your first slide up if you want to get started. The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so as, as Carla mentioned, I've been uh, living with uh, hydrocephalus since I was 22, uh, my second year playing with the 49ers back during the 81 Super Bowl season. I would had a number of concussions during the course of my career, uh, my career being uh, beginning at 11 years old when I played Pee Wee Pop Warner and ultimately developed hydrocephalus during the 81 season. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And this is a spec scan of, of a normal brain. And I put in there big letters, this is your brain. Next slide. This is, this is my brain, and uh, this is what happens when you play football sometimes. So there's a lot of areas in there that show uh, no or poor um, blood flow, damage, um, a lot of damage to my prefrontal lobe, which, you know, impacts my judgment. And, um, okay, next slide. When I was injured in 81, uh, I had a, my first brain surgery was, I believe it was September, and I remember it was September because I turned 23 in intensive care. And then, um, four months after the Super Bowl, uh, nine months later, my shunt failed. Um, I had two more shunt revisions, uh, 10 hours apart. I was given last rites. My shunt actually failed. I was in Mexico fishing with my brother when it went out. So brought me home in a coma. Two more brain surgeries, 10 hours apart, last rites. And then I was also given the hospital bills, and it started a huge battle for me to fight just for my workers' comp, right? 
months to get my bills paid. And during my trial, uh, which I literally had to sit on stand years later and be grilled by, by their, um, the 49ers attorney, uh, this was a quote from me, and, I, and I've always used this, a traumatic brain injury is like throwing a rock in a pond. The ripple effect as to the number of people affected is huge. And to me what that means is that uh, my, my injury has impacted me uh, due to anger management issues, poor judgment, it impacts my wife. My wife will go to school where she teaches and tell one of her teacher friends, you know, she's upset what's going on. Her friend goes home and tells her husband, you know, little Johnny isn't going to play football. Johnny's mad. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Um, next, please. And so I, I kind of take offense to, the, they term this a mild traumatic brain injury. I think that's, that's it, it doesn't make sense if it's mild and traumatic. And so um, I, I really do take offense to mildly, but I do understand that there are some very, very much worse brain injuries. But to me, all brain injuries are, are serious. Uh, TBI, um, it's the most prevalent brain injury, uh, most often missed at the time of initial injury. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, saying that, hey, you bumped your head, you saw stars, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, well, when you see stars, your brain is banging against your skull. So 15% uh, of all those who suffer a TBI still have symptoms uh, more than a year later. Um, TBI causes a, a brief change in mental status, usually less than 30 minutes. And then post-injury symptoms are what are known as post-concussion uh, concussive syndrome. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, I went through some of the things that I suffered uh, personally over the years, and I kind of put a check mark as to how, how intensive it was for me. Fatigue is a huge one uh, for the first year or two after my brain surgeries. There were weeks or months where I would literally sleep you know, 20 hours a day. Uh, barely get up, eat, uh, barely try to get some work done, and be wiped out. Um, that slowly, slowly diminished over the years, but I still have some issues in the afternoons. Um, headaches, of course, uh, and and what I have is these these uh, these are uh, pre-treatment. Basically, what I'm showing the checks: visual disturbances, uh, a lot of sensitivity to light. Uh, I can't sleep if there's a light on. Um, in fact, once the sun gets up 5.30 in the morning, I, I'm, I'm awake, um, even with, I'll put an extra blanket over the window. Poor attention concentration, um, or excuse me, memory loss, that has been my biggest, biggest hurdle to, to live with over the years. Literally, um, just like today, you know, I, I had Carla call me a week in advance. Uh, pretty much emailed me every day for five days in advance. Today she has sent at least four reminders uh, to myself and to Renee um, from Integrated Play, who I work very closely with. So they're constantly sending me reminders, and that's just the way I have to live. Uh, poor attention, concentration, very easy to get distracted. Again, I talked about sleep disturbances due to um, inflammation of the neurons. There are, are times where I just can't shut things off. And I've literally gone up to four nights straight unable to sleep. Irritability, uh, of course, that goes hand in hand with unable to sleep. You never get into REM where your brain gets a chance to, to recover. Um, seizures, I've had grandma seizures for ever since I was ori originally injured at age 22. Lots of motivation. Uh, uh, you know, there are. I put that in there just because there are things that I, I used to really, really uh, be... Um, excited about and really focused about, and um, I find myself over the years, I just have apathy toward things that I would really love to do. Next, please. Other symptoms, uh, nausea, uh, of course, we're all, most of us are aware of a, a sign of intracranial pressure is projectile vomiting. I used to tell the doctors when my chuck goes out, uh, and I vomited, I could hit the ball from 20 yards away. Um, loss of smell, mine is probably worse than that now. I should probably have three checks on there. Sensitivity to sounds, it is very, very hard for me to filter out background noise. 
Um, when I went back to school in 86 to finish my biology degree, I had five more brain surgeries in one 10-month period and um, several grand mal seizures. And the only way I could study, I had to go to the library and find a, a cubicle in the very back of, of the building where no one would walk by me. Even someone walking by would distract me. Um, if I have a book on my desk while I'm working, I, I'll be thinking about the book, and I have to have everything off my desk. So um, uh, very, very, uh, it's easy for me to um, uh, get um, distracted. And here's a great example. I probably got off track of what I was talking about, and this is very typical with me. I, I got to get rain. I'll get rain back in. So um, mood changes. Uh, I was a very, very easygoing guy, even as a football player. Um, now I'm, I can be volatile at times. I've never been physical with anyone, thank God. But uh, my poor family never knows who's walking in the door. I get lost or confused um, when I walk out of a store. Half the time, I won't even know what door I went in, and, and to find my, my vehicle is usually a, a pain. I'll, I carry a notebook. I'll write on my notebook when I park, if I'm at a mall, where I park. Uh, slowness in thinking. Just a moment ago, when I was speaking, I, I was kind of grasping for words, um, and that's very typical of me. Uh, dizziness, loss of balance, and then uh, feelings of depression. You know, I never used to think of myself as depressed, but as I spoke to more and more professionals, you know, depression can be symptoms just like I talked about, apathy towards things you love to do, um, no energy, and so um, those are some of the things I've dealt with. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. So in the beginning, um, this is how it all started for me. Next. My, the first year I played football, uh, 1970 West Stockton Bear Cubs in California. And I was 11 years old, and believe it or not, on this little 29-man team, three of us went on to sign NFL contracts, all of us in 1980. And the kid in the lower left front row, number 11, Vaughn Hayes, went on to a uh, Major League All-Star career uh, with the Philadelphia, Major League Baseball All-Star career with the Philadelphia Phillies. So we started off, uh, it was quite the team. Next, please. And so I, I went on from there. I went on to uh, Stag High School in Stockton. I played on an undefeated um, nationally ranked team my senior year. Uh, attended. I was a good student. I had a 3.0 GPA. And I grew up in very humble settings. My dad drove a beer truck and raised six of us. And I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew I needed to earn a scholarship. And I, I attended University of Colorado Football Scholarship in 1976 where I majored in um, fisheries biology. We played in the 1977 Orange Bowl against the, uh, against the old Woody Hayes, Ohio State. And then, uh, next please. Next slide, please. Uh, then I was actually drafted by the Jets in 1980. Um, was cut at the end of preseason, which was never in my plan. Um, the 49ers picked me up early in the 1980 season and actually the very first play I played for them was uh, I think it was the fifth game of the season they brought me in and the very first play uh, early in the first quarter against the Dallas Cowboys I suffered a major concussion uh, was was hit uh, right in the temple on a Dallas tight end trap. Um, basically I played the entire game I never missed a play or practice and later on in the week when my memory returned, the trainers and doctors laughingly told me I went through over 20 smelling salts to keep me on the field. And again, never missed a play or practice. Next slide, please. Uh, we can kind of go through that. So um, my third year Pop Warner, like I said, I started in seventh grade. Um, I'll, gonna run, I'll run through this fairly quickly. My third year Pop Warner, uh, I knocked myself unconscious in a, in, a, in a tackling drill and was hospitalized. So that began my, my major concussions. Next, please. Um, like I said, I went on to Stag High School. Uh, and now as I look back on it, um, 
you know, what I considered concussions until not long ago were times I was either knocked unconscious or, or hauled off the field walking sideways. You know, now they're talking about if you hit your head enough, hard enough to see stars, that's a minor concussion. Well, basically I suffered thousands of them during the course of my career. Um, uh, fractured my C6 and C7 vertebrae, but that was run diagnosed till 87. Never really missed any time on that. Um, during my college career, I had three major concussions. Um, and it's funny, just this last year, I had a phone call from a, a very good friend of mine that I grew up with in Stockton, and he went on to play with the Oregon Ducks. And we were talking, and he said, I remember when we played with you guys your senior year, George, when you made a tackle, you were unconscious, face down on the carpet, they hauled you off, and you came back in the next series. And, and I said, really? He goes, don't you remember? My parents were there. You went to dinner with them after the game. And that was one I've never even counted. Now, one thing I tell people is that when you have concussions, you're the last one to know. Um, and then so uh, I mentioned my, my last major concussion against the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, maybe one I also had a knee surgery. Next, please. And so TBI symptoms. In 81, uh, just prior to my first brain surgery, I started developing major pounding headaches every night after practice, uh, projectile vomiting. Uh, the edge of my vision would, would light up like somebody had a flashlight on the back of my head, and I would get a ball of light in front of each eye which I, I've since learned is symptoms that there's pressure, swelling, intracranial pressure and swelling on my, or pressure on my optic nerves. Uh, my hearing would come and go with the beat of my heart when I had these pounding headaches. Uh, that finally went into focal point paralysis of my right arm the last night before my surgery. Uh, my arm literally curled up across my chest and I couldn't move it. Uh, originally, Three weeks prior, that all this had been diagnosed as high blood pressure by the team doctor, and I was on high blood pressure pills for that two and a half or three weeks until uh, I had the focal point paralysis. Next, please. And then, 81, I had my first knee surgery at the 49ers, and then in September, I had my very first brain surgery. Now, here, here's something that I, I want people to know about. In the next nine months after my first brain surgery and before my second and third, I was arrested three times. I had never in my life prior or since been in trouble. And every time I was, and, and, and every time I was arrested, it was after I'd go out and have a couple beers like we did most nights. And I, before I even got arrested the first time, I started hearing stories of me doing things totally out of character. And I thought I'd get up in the morning and go to practice. My truck wouldn't be in front of my apartment. And I would have no idea where I left it. I would call people, did you see me last night? Did you see me? And so things were, were getting really weird for me. Uh, after my second and third brain surgeries, um, I was tested for uh, brain seizures. They basically gave me two beers to drink and they did an EEG. And I was fine as far as functioning, but uh, the EEG showed I had major brain seizures from alcohol. And so I quit drinking in 1982 at the age of 23, and I've never had a problem since. Okay, next please. So then, uh, 84, 85, I had two more knee surgeries. I returned to school uh, in 86. Like I mentioned, I had four, but I counted them up the other day, and I actually had five brain surgeries during that 10 month period. After one of the surgeries, I returned to school two days later. I didn't want to drop out. I'd been in organic chemistry three times and had to drop out due to surgeries. And I came back to school with 50 staples in the back of my head, and uh, I had a major seizure in class. So I dropped out, came back again. Um, during that time frame, they discovered I had compression fractures in my C6 and C7 vertebrae um, from, from playing. Next, please. Then, so after the seizures, I was originally on Dilantin for a number of years, and my short-term memory was just, it was just horrible. Uh, it was a nightmare. So I finally weaned my, myself off of it. Um, I'll back up a little bit. After every surgery I had, uh, they would put me on anti-seizure meds for a few months as you're susceptible to seizures, and then they'd wean me off of it. Well, after the... Uh, 
we're in 82. See, I'm kind of losing track here, but to 82, they had me on it for quite a while. Um, and I weaned myself off of it in 93. And I actually went till 99, and out of the blue, I had a major seizure. And they put me on Depakote. Well, Depakote's not time release, so I'd have to remember to take one of these big horse pills during the middle of the day. And I'd pull one out of my pocket with no water, try to suck it down, and I developed the esophageal ulcers. So I went to phenobarbital, which just just wiped me out. I, I had no energy to do anything. I stayed on that to 06. I tried Keppra. Um, and then it was so bad that uh, they put me on Lexapro on top of Keppra to try to improve my memory. 2007, I went to Zonogram, uh, stayed on the Lexapro, still had short-term memory issues. In 09, I went to Lamectal. Uh, I seemed to have the least amount of side effects, but I was also having major um, sleep issues. I got up to four nights straight without sleep. They put me on Ambien. In 2009, things really changed for me. I um, went down to Dr. Amon's clinic for a three-day neuropsych evaluation. He, he recommended I get on omega-3 fish oils, I, and he recommended hyperbaric oxygen treatments. Uh, things started to, uh, uh, they continued to deteriorate at first, um, and they continued throwing more drugs at me. I was on Respiradol, Lexapro, Aricept, Namenda, all at once plus Lamectal for seizures, Ambien for sleep, and it got to where I literally couldn't even find my way home from work twice in, in one month. I was vomiting several times a day, dizzy, and the doctor, my, my primary care, told my wife and I that we needed to get our finances in order, file for SSI, and, and start preparing. And I said, prepare for what? He says, well, George, you know you have frontal lobe dementia and there's no cure for it. Well, I told him I have three children and a hardworking school teacher wife, and it's not time for me to check out. So we really got serious on the recovery issues. I got into hyperbarics more and more. I started taking huge doses of omega-3s, and I quit all the drugs, and I can think again. Next, please. So hyperbaric oxygen treatments have been a, a godsend for me. I get the treatments down at the Sacramento Clinic, and then several months ago, I had to move to Southern Cal um, to get more treatment on my brain. I'm going to brain, it's B-R-A-I-N, um, it's brain research injury and, and networking. Uh, I move down here literally away from my family, and I get neurocognitive treatment daily now. But hyperbaric oxygen, for the years after my first brain surgeries, the first eight, uh, yeah, I was never given any treatment until I started the hyperbarics. So uh, real quickly, what some of the hyperbaric oxygen does, it, it improves cellular metabolism. Okay, ATP is kind of your gasoline of your cells. So your mitochondria produce ATP, and that's what basically runs you. When you have a brain injury, a lot of your neurons and brain cells, they don't die, but they get stunned. And and the hyperbaric oxygen treatment will reactivate that mitochondria in those cells, and they start producing ATP again, and those cells wake up and start functioning. Um, it stops apoptosis, um, reactivates uh, neurogenesis in the neural stem and progenitor cells, just like I was talking about. It actually helps new neurons uh, to, to grow, and all of this is validated by spec scans and performance tests and, and behavior reports. I have all of these pre- Hyperbarics, every 40 treatments, I, I get tested again, and um, I've had 230-some-odd hyperbarics now in the last four years, and uh, my microcognitive memory scores had improved over 15%. Next, please. The HBO benefits, it works for acute and chronic stages. So uh, if you can get someone immediately after... Uh, a head injury, uh, it, it reduces inflammatory response, uh, prevents swelling, um, some of the longer the chronic stages promotes neur neur new neuron growth and repairs damaged cells. Next please. So um, on the short term, the
first few cells, free radicals, you know, uh, those cause inflammation and will actually damage and destroy cells. So it reduces free radicals. Again, as I mentioned, it reactivates mitochondria. Um, it stops apoptosis and long-term atrophy uh, of your brain. It causes new neuronal, new neuronal growth. Um, impact uh, test measures measurements for using improve um, short-term memory, improves executive functioning, improve response times. These are all val validified by impact uh, testing. And then uh, the SPECT scans uh, show apparent normalization of the brain function. So I've had SPECT scans pre hyperbarics and after every 40 treatments when I get reevaluated we have another SPECT scan. So I have a history of five of them now, five or six, I can't remember. But um, uh, so and they do show somewhat um, uh, improvement on each one. Next, please. Um, so long-term benefits, uh, up to 80 treatments, increases stem cell, cell production up to 800%. Um, again, I'm not going to go through each one of these mitochondria um, permanent improvement. So that's permanent. Those, these, when you go through the hyperbarics, it's not just temporary treatment where you feel better and, and once you quit, it's done. These are permanent improvements and behavioral changes. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, I had some major anger management issues, um, uh, judgment issues. These have helped with the anger management issues. Um, tremendously. And a lot of that is just due to the inflammation in your brain and you can't sleep, uh, irritable. That all ties into, you know, anger issues. Next, please. So question, what is the benefit of HBOT? Okay. I guess we'll turn this over to the crowd. They can send a, a question. Do we have a question on the next one? Yep, we do. I'm going to launch that poll question now. Please take a moment to answer. Okay. I'll give you a few more seconds to answer. All right, I'm closing the poll now and sharing the results. So it looks like the majority of people answered all of the above, which uh, is the correct answer. Excellent. Excellent job. And that's coming from, uh, I actually taught science for two and a half years in high school years ago. So excellent students. <laughs> so we'll go to the next. Okay, coping mechanisms. This is where I had to force myself to become an expert on this. Trying to finish school, run, I had businesses, um, just daily functioning, you know, I've learned to, I have 30 years of, of notebooks, I write everything down, I carry these little right in the rain notebooks, they're waterproof and they fit right in your back pocket, and I always have a pen behind my ear, when my phone rings, I immediately write down the time, and as I'm speaking, I'll I'll write down the conversation and every night or two, every two or three times, two or three times a week, I'll try to read back the prior week or two and it reinforces what I did and who I spoke to even if I don't remember it. And I will have things in there like I met with Senator Ted Gaines uh, last year and I, I know what we spoke about. I don't remember meeting with him, but I know what we spoke about because I've read about it many, many times. So I'm always going back through my notes and reading. And people that work with me or know me, whenever they call me, usually, especially clients, the first thing they'll say is, you have your, uh, your notebook handy. Uh, Post-its. I probably keep post-its in, in, in business. I, uh, I will have them as I'm looking at my computer right now, I have four of them on my laptop as I'm speaking. Um, I will put post-its. Uh, before I go to bed at night, I'll think, what do I need to do in the morning? And I'll, I'll put, I'll write down things I need to do. I'll put them on my mirror. I get up in the in the morning to go brush my teeth and, and, and shave. Here's my reminders. Okay, I go in to make my coffee. I have sits on my coffee maker. I get out in the truck to go to work. 
there's the same post-it uh, on the dashboard of my truck. I open up my computer like I did just now, and here's here's some post-its reminding me of things to do. Um, beepers. I had reminders just for this this meeting alone at two weeks, one week, uh, the five days prior, and then every hour, uh, several hours prior to the meeting, and then every 15 minutes or so, and, and I would literally have reminders up to 15 minutes, and I'm working on a report, I think I'm going to finish this paragraph or sentence, and four hours later I'll get a phone call from somebody livid that I missed this big meeting. So I literally, my short-term memory sometimes just evaporates uh, almost instantly if I'm not staying on top of it. Beeper on my phone. As I mentioned, you know, don't be shy. Let people know you have a memory deficit. Um, I look at it this way, you know, people are always embarrassed to talk about brain injuries, but, you know, no one's embarrassed about talking about, you know, I've had three knee surgeries and, you know, broken, you know, people have broken legs and, and no one's embarrassed about that. I have, to me, there, it's no different. It's an injury uh, or a, um, a congenital injury. We had nothing to do with it. I'm not embarrassed about it. And I'm very open about what's going on with me. And I let people know I'll just I work harder than an average person to get things done. And so um, I let everyone around know me, and it's very helpful. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I'm always telling people, <laughs> don't let me forget my appointments. And thank God I do. People will have a lot of folks in my corner um, helping me out with this. And that's what you need to do. You need to get a, a circle. Uh, you need a team to help you through this. And um, everybody helps a little bit, and they pick up a little bit of slack. And it is, it is tremendously helpful to, to me, and it would be to a lot of other folks out there. Um, next, please. Um, another, this is very important for me. Years ago, I was... Oh, I was going on 40 before we got married, but many years prior to that, every doctor's appointment, I would take my older brother with me. And the night before, we would sit down, and to this day I still do it. My wife and I will sit down and we'll go over everything that went on since my last appointment. Um, okay, what questions do we have? We write them down. We basically make a game plan like we did in football. And when we go in to see these doctors, um, I will flat out tell them, Forget about your 15-minute appointment with me. If we have a lot of questions, you plan on spending some time. So we'll ask very pointed questions. Um, and another thing, too, I've noticed is you can have five people in the same room, and everyone will hear the same statement a little differently. I always hear the positive. I'll walk out of a doctor's appointment and say, hey, he said I'm doing really well. And uh, when I used to go with my older brother, who coached football for years, he would look at me like I was crazy. He goes, what are you talking about? Yeah, they said this was good, but then he would rattle off four things that they said that I'm not doing well in. So um, take someone in with you. Um, again, draft questions a day before. Another thing, uh, when I was back in school finishing my biology degree, during that batch of five surgeries, I developed dyslexia. And I learned that the hard way when I was in organic. Again, when I had three surgeries in organic, and I, I we were doing a lot of um, isomers where we had to draw these isomers where they flipped cis and trans. One went upside down, one, one was a mirror image. And uh, I found out the hard way that I was flipping them and then I'd flip them back to normal. And so I've learned to double and triple check. And a lot of times you need to kind of step away because it'll look fine the first three times you look at it. And if you step away and totally clear your mind and think of another subject, and then I'll look at my work again, and, and boom, it just, it's just very blatant, the things I have backwards. Um, and another thing I learned, too, is dyslexia can be triggered by standard uh, 60 hertz electrical cycles. That's basically what our standard elect electrical systems are, are wired to. Um, and I learned also that most universities will have at least one room wired on a different hertz cycle, specifically for dyslexics. And so for... The rest of my exams, I had I had another three or four more years of school after my organic class. Every one of my exams, not just 
chemistry, but every exam I took, I, I set up to have it taken in this other room on the library at school. So those are some things people need to be aware of. Um, uh, just the fact that, you know, like I said, a standard uh, electrical system, your standard lights in your house can trigger it or your office. Next, please. Then I got into, like I said, 2009, a lot of things really changed for me. Um, Dr. Barry Sears reached out to me, and he has, he's a world-renowned expert on reducing inflammation through diet, dietary changes. And he also uh, got me on the omega-3 fish oils. Basically, omega-3s are, are uh, DHA and EPA acids. And if you were to dry your brain, that's, that's basically what a lot of your brain is made out of. So omega-3s are great. When you do buy them, though, make sure you read on the label. Uh, because fatty fish, and I'm speaking as a, as a wildlife biologist here, fatty fish store all kinds of toxins in their fats and oils, uh, PCBs, heavy metals, um, all types of carcinogens. So you want to make sure on the label of your fish oil you buy, uh, you can get them right at, you know, in the grocery store, Make sure they say something to the effect of industrial grade purified or something like that. And then on the back, you want to look at the ratio of DHA to EPA acids. And they will they'll have, have those on the label. And, and ideally, you want to see a two to one ratio of DHA over EPA. And then, um, again, I got on his antioxidants um, to reduce inflammation. Uh, concentrated cranberry, blueberry juices. Uh, extremely high in antioxidants. The latest is ACI berry. Now that one is, has even more antioxidant capabilities than these other do. And you can get these in capsules now. So instead of me drinking a gallon of this stuff a day, I take uh, a capsule in the morning and a capsule at night. Um, neuroplasticity. For years they always told us that once you're brain damaged, that's it. This is as good as you'll ever be. Well, lo and behold, they're finding out now that you can actually, we use a small part of our brain, and so you can fire up different parts of your brain that you're not using or that aren't damaged. Do things out of the ordinary. Uh, if you're right-handed, you know, force yourself to use your left hand. Um, simple things like drive home a different route every day from work. You get into this, this automatic pilot driving home, you really don't have to think. Well, if you force your brain to think, it's just like in football when we worked out. Uh, or lifted weights, you've got you've to work your muscle or your brain like a muscle. Um, kids' memory games are great. You know, the little memory games where you have to remember what's under what cup, things like that. Um, word games. Read. I try to read now um, as much as I can at night. Uh, it's great for the brain and it helps you kind of settle things down too. So again, work your brain like your muscles or it'll atrophy just like your muscles will. Next, please. Um, I briefly touched on neurogenesis, and we did speak about um, plasticity. But uh, So basically, neurogenesis is the birth of new uh, neuronal cells. And, you know, the old school of thinking, not till not too long ago, they thought that, uh, one, like I said, once, once we were uh, uh, fully developed, that was it. You didn't grow any more brain cells. Well, they're finding out now that, you know, we can grow new, new neurons, get them back into the areas where your brain cells do still function, um, and that this continues on through adult life. Um, uh, the hippocampus of mammals, the hippocampus is very important to us. Um, and ongoing neurogenesis is thought to be an important mechanism, uh, the important mechanism underlying neuronal plasticity. Okay, so neuronal plasticity we spoke about earlier, uh, doing things out of the ordinary, forcing your brain to work, and it forces neurogenesis to start cranking, uh, kicking in, to cause new neurons to grow, to awaken existing neurons that aren't being used. Um, and so, uh, Neuronal plasticity you know, enables us to adapt to environmental changes, um, and it enables us to, uh, um, you know, help with our learning and memory throughout life. So, work your brain, do things out of the ordinary, uh, and cause this neurogenesis to kick in. Next, please.
So we have a, a moment here for a, a question. All right, I'm going to launch the poll question now. Please take a moment to answer. I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, I'm closing the poll now and sharing the results. Excellent. And the majority of people said true, George. Excellent. Good, good students we have today. <laughs> I'm going to put a star on everybody's paper. Okay, next please. So basically I'm going to kind of wind this down. Um, the ways I have, and we have a little more time, I think, than uh, we had planned on, but um, uh, never say never. I, I have been told so many times these last 32, 33 years that you can't do this, you won't be able to do that, you're never going to finish a biology degree. I heard that many times. You'll never get through organic chemistry. Yet I did, and I went on to go through biochem, cell physiology, two semesters of physics, pre-calc. Um, you know, I, what I say is I never say never. You know, um, if someone tells you you can't do it, to me that's always just been like a, uh, when people are, throw things negative at me, I use them to, to fuel myself. It's like a chunk of wood, and I have a, a fire burning in my belly. And I just I throw that that negativity they throw at me into to, to fuel myself, but the key is you need a game plan, and uh, you need a short term and a long term uh, goals. And so short term goals that I would have, you know, when I, I I I go back to school a lot because that was such a struggle for me to finish my biology degree during those surgeries and seizures. That if I had really stepped back and thought, oh man, you have another four more semesters of chemistry after this organic, you know, with all the brain surgery, I would have quit. But what I did was I would just sit down and I'd say, okay, today I want to learn this one equation. And if it took me two hours, I was done. If it took me nine hours, okay, that's what it took. And then I would say, okay, by the end of the week I want uh, this part of the chapter done. And then by the end of the month, I want you know these two chapters done. And I just took those short, choppy steps. I, I wasn't inundated by everything I had to do. I focused on today's task, and I just got it done. Um, and so, and again, don't take no for an answer. Those of us that that, that have to live with TBI and you, the family members, all this information I, I passed out, I'm addressing not just the TBI survivors, but the TBI family members. Because you family folks take a, a, a greater beating than we do. What this has done to my wife and children, um, the, the stress on all of them, it's horrific. I deal with it every day, but uh, what it does to people around me, is, it's horrible. And so don't take no for an answer. You know, people are going to be negative. Uh, it's, it's really easy to say you can't do that, uh, push you out the door next. You know, here, take these drugs and next. Um, and then getting back to the drugs, like I mentioned to you, uh, or maybe I didn't, I, I can't remember if I even talked about the drugs I was on. But at one point in time, um, I'm probably repeating myself here, but just bear with me. I was on Lexapro, Lamectal, Aricep, Namenda, and Respiradol, and Ambien for sleep. And it was just a nightmare. Um, I think maybe I'd said that already, but again, I, I do this a lot. Uh, and and then expect to lose ground on occasion. You know, just like in a football game, you know, quarterbacks get sacked. You, 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 you have a fumble. Things are going to happen, okay? That's just part of the game. And you got to just get back out there and, 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 you know, get back on the ball, head down, and just keep, you know, grinding out four yards a, a pop. I tell people. If a football team only got four yards every carry, they didn't get any more or any less, they would never lose a game. And then you think about it, because every single time they got the ball, they would get first down, first down, first down, first down and score. And unless the other team scored every single time they got the ball, uh, they, they, would, they would win every single game. 
a simple four yards. You don't have to throw a long bomb and, and, and bust loose an 80 yard TD run. Short, choppy steps. And so, you know, you're going to lose some ground on occasion. That's going to happen. And, and focus on your positives. What, you know, again, we get inundated with everything we can't do or everything we did wrong or everything that's hard to do. So focus on what you're doing right, even something little. It may be something as simple as today I was able to brush my teeth by myself. Um, uh, maybe even, even not even to that extent. Today I was able to get uh, a couple syllables out. And I, and I work with, with folks that, that that is a great victory for them, being able to just get a single syllable out. But that's the beginning. That's a short, choppy step right there. And then uh, key on low-hanging fruit. Pick the easiest things to get done first. Uh, and that's what, that's what low-hanging fruit are. If you're picking fruit off a tree, you're not going to climb to the top to get a plum when you have 20 down the lower branch. You know, get those lower easy ones first. And as you do, you're going to build up your confidence, and you're going to start uh, busting out of that depression that you can't get things done. And, um, and, and that's going to fuel you. And again, uh, short, choppy steps. And what that means, that's a football term. And again, if I repeat myself, bear with me. But in football, if you have your head up and you're looking clear down the goal line 80 yards away, and you take a big, long stride, in fact, some of you right now, if you were to stand up and take and stride out, oh, put your foot out there about three or four feet out in front of you, okay? Now you'll notice when you stride like that, your feet are real narrow. And have someone standing around, you just put one finger on your shoulder and push you from the side. And where do you go? You, you, you fall over sideways. Football, you want your feet shoulder width apart. You want your toe to the instep. And you want to take, and you want your butt down and head up. And you want short, choppy steps. Those are your most powerful steps. And if you do that and you keep grinding out four yards a pop, you're going to win. And so you can win this battle with TBI by focusing on these short, choppy steps. Um, I believe that's about the last slide, I think. We can go to the next if there is. Oh, yeah, there's the next one. We'll go next, please. And so questions. Uh, if you have any questions you want to shoot to me, there's our email. Um, you can go to the visitorgroup.org. We are still building it, but it, it is a, a website that's designed to just be a clinic house for brain injury information and brain injury recovery. Uh, we have coordinated with several folks that this is what they do for a living. Um, uh, brain, go to Brain's website. Like I said, I literally moved down here to Southern California uh, weeks ago to just get treatment, and I've had tremendous treatment at Brain. So you can go to their website, which is www.thebrainsite.org. Um, just like it sounds, thebrainsite.org. Again, that's, and BRAIN stands for Brain Research Injury and Networking. So you can Google that. Sue and Jerry Reeb uh, started that whole uh, organization uh, when their daughter was brain damaged. And they, have, they are to have totally dedicated their lives to working with folks and helping folks with brain damage. Um, so, great. You can also go to the brainhealingfoundation.org. Um, that was started by another ex-NFL player, Dave Pear, up in Seattle. Robert Lee runs the blog. Uh, another clearinghouse for, for brain injury information. So that's also the brainhealingfoundation.org. And support your BIAs, too. Um, uh, I thank uh, Carla here at the New York uh, Brain Injury Association for even giving me an opportunity um, to speak here. I work closely with the California Brain Injury Association. Um, I was their Traumatic Brain Injury Survivor Volunteer of the Year Award a couple years ago, which I which was caught me totally off guard. But um, uh, support these folks. You can go to our Facebook. We have a Traumatic Brain Injury Information Support Group um, and uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, you can Twitter me, and any information that I have, if I don't have the answers, I will pass you on to someone that has them. 
So I think we're getting close to winding down on this. I don't know if there's another slide. Oh, thanks, George. I'm just going to give a few reminders before we move on to the question and answer session. Perfect. Um, just a little bit of information about us. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with our webinars, we are a statewide nonprofit membership organization that advocates on behalf of individuals with brain injuries and their families. Um, we have uh, our contact information on this slide if you'd like to get in contact with us or visit our website. Uh, we also have some great free resources that have to do with concussion. Um, we're working a lot on um, concussion management in schools, so if you'd like to get any uh, copies of these resources, please contact us. We do have them available electronically um, on our website as well. These are some more resources I thought to include that are related to concussion. We are focusing, obviously, on our uh, students. We want to protect them. We do have uh, monthly webinars, so keep visiting our website, www.biaNYS.org, for more information. And just in closing, am I still on? Yep, you're still on, George. Okay, great. And uh, if we're going to close this out real quickly, um, uh, you can go to our website. Uh, we have uh, uh, wristbands that we sell. Uh, all that money will go to brain, uh, either the Brain Foundation or the Brain Healing Foundation, or we use a little bit to run the Visitor uh, Group. Um, we have two wristbands. One is short, choppy steps, like we talked about. And the other one I use when I speak to sports groups, it says, use your head, don't use your head. And what we're trying to do is get these football teams to take the head out of the game as much as possible. And then also we have a, uh, I have a short ebook that we wrote a while ago with Irv Muchnick. It's titled uh, Out of My Head, My Life in and Out of Football. It's a kind of an interesting little look. It's a very short read. But you can go to Concussions, Inc. and order that, or you can order it on our website. And then um, I'm also working. Working on a right on a full length book too at some point in time. I'm hoping to get that out soon. So Yeah, I'm gonna leave it up on your contact information, George, so everyone can take it down if they want to get in contact with you. Okay. Um, and you know, thank you again so much for doing this. We do have some questions that already came in. Okay. Um, again, we have we have a good amount of time. If for whatever reason someone's question isn't answered, please feel free to email it to me. I'll be happy to get it to George or contact George directly. Um, but we do have some questions. George, the first one is from an attendee. Uh, they wanted to know, have you ever uh, tried neurofeedback? Um, apparently it is being used right now um, in forward operating bases in Afghanistan, um, and it, it, uh, it has been showing considerable efficacy. Is that something you're familiar with? I'm familiar with it. I've never tried it yet, but that's on my list. Um, another question I have for you is, did you ever return to work, and if so, what are you doing now? Did you receive any assistance from your state vocational rehabilitation agency, and if so, what did that look like? Uh, what was the very first question? Have you, um, did you return to work, and if so, what are you doing now? And I think you talked a little bit about the Visker group. Yeah, uh, what I did was um, when I uh, when I was done playing in '82 and I had those two more brain surgeries, I went right back to work. I worked construction with my older brother. Uh, we had always planned on working together, and I basically had to start from the ground up. I started as a laborer at six bucks an hour. I was bouncing at nights, worked my way up into where I had my own general contractor's license. Uh, when I finished my degree in 1990, at age 32, I went to work as a wildlife biologist. Uh, for years, I started my own environmental consulting business, the Visger Group, um, or Visger and Associates, excuse me, in 2003, doing wildlife work, uh, water quality issues. Uh, merged my company in 2006 with a, with a big engineering firm from Washington. And in 2009, things really started to, to get tough for me, and I was let go, and um, basically I had to kind of just been scratching and trying to get back on my feet. Um, but the brain injury thing here is is everything else it's gotten to be very, very tough for me. But I did use 
um, you know, when I went back to school, I went through um, vocational rehab through work comp. So they paid because I won that case. They, uh, my employer was obliged by law to retrain me to fill the work. And all I asked for was let me finish my degree. So I did use that, and thank God I did. Excellent. Um, I have another uh, question. This individual wants to thank you uh, very much for sharing your experiences and wants uh, to know what would one uh, thing you would tell young athlete, athletes today who think they don't need to, to take concussions seriously be? What would you tell them? What would I tell the young athletes what? What would you tell young athletes who don't think they need to take concussions seriously? You know, I will tell you this. Well, let's just put it this way. I, I loved the game, and, and this was a passion of mine. But And I looked forward to my son playing. And I tell you, my son will never play. The last few years have been so damaging to my family. Um, trying to remember where I park my truck every day, simple things like that. Um, uh, right now, as I said that, I, I have no idea where I parked a little bit ago. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a joke. It's not like you know, spraining sprain an ankle or having knee surgery. Your brain is who you are. It is who you are. And you damage that thing, and you're not going to be the same person. And it, it, it's not a joke. I, I go around, I speak at all, I speak at high school, colleges, I speak at pro groups. Um, people need to, to, to just start really acknowledging how serious these things are. And especially in football, they downplay all your injuries. You know, all the sayings, you suck it up, no pain, no gain. Um, uh, you got your bell rung. I take great offense to that when they're talking about concussions and they call them ringing your bell. So to young players out there, play smart. Watch out for yourself. And better yet, watch out for your teammates. When a player has a concussion, like I mentioned earlier, he or she is the last one to know. And I say she. There are more concussions in, in girls' soccer than any other sport. Gymnastics. I, I was working with a young lady earlier this year, cheerleader, who during practice took a heck of a fall off one of the top of the pyramids, and she's still dealing with it. Um, so you need to look out for your friends and your teammates. A guy comes back to the huddle, and he's looking out his ear hole, and he's a little confused. You know what? Wave to the silence. Get them out of there. So these are some of the things you need to do. Excellent. I agree 100%. Um, I have another question from an attendee here. Have you investigated the Center for Neuroskills? Um, this individual says they are a top-notch, full-service outpatient facility for survivors in Bakersfield. I don't know if you're familiar I, with that. I, I have. I work very closely with Center for Neuroskills out here in California. Um, Dr. Mark Ashley, uh, I do. I, I work closely with those guys. Mark and I, or, or Dr. Ashley and I, have both spoken together at conferences. Uh, we addressed the uh, annual California School Nurses Conference together um, this last year, I believe it was. Or I have a real problem with time frames, so it was either this year or last year. But uh, I am aware of them. Do work with them. A uh, great resource. Um, I have another question. Do you have trouble remembering your biology studies too, or are your memory problems mostly short term? You know, everything. Uh, see, for me, sh short term is, is, I mean, for me, long term are, are things that happened either before my very first brain surgery, you know, very vivid memories of college and high school, um, things like that. And I have vivid memories of, of some parts in between, you know, these last 32 years. But um, the biology part, this is what kills me, is I'll be out look on a site and I'll see a plant that I used to know the scientific name of, and it's just gone. Um, things like that, it, it can come back once I, I pull my, my field guides out, and then it's like, oh, yeah, I do remember that now. But um, yeah, that's been a real, real struggle. In fact, it got to be such a, a struggle for me. I finally had to kind of pack it in being a biologist um, a while ago. I'm still getting the treatments, trying to get back on my feet. But it's just been, um, I can't keep track of a lot of that stuff. I have a question about the hyperbaric oxygen treatments. Uh, this attendee would like to know, 
uh, would you have any idea of how much they cost, and is it something that insurance would cover? You know, um, the first question is on the costs. It will vary. Uh, if you go to a hospital, it is ridiculous. We were pulling up some costs the other day, anywhere from $1,400 to $2,500 of treatment. I go to a freestanding clinic, uh, one in Sacramento, and now I'm living in Southern Cal. I go to one up here, South Bay Hyperbarics, and uh, those treatments are like $170. So depends where you go. Uh, the, the, the cost can vary. And as far as insurance coverage, um, there are what they call 17 approved indications, meaning there are 17 different injuries that insurance companies will approve. Um, uh, diabetic foot wounds is one. Um, carbon dioxide poisoning is another. Right now, they have not approved uh, traumatic brain injury treatments, although I do have, through another one of my major battles, I do have um, or did have the 49ers work comp paying for mine because they were written a prescription, but we're back in a huge battle now. They quit paying all my bills. I don't know, two or three years ago, they all, they, and, and, and graciously the Sacramento Clinic and South Bay Hyperbaric have been treating me. Um, they owe the Sacramento Clinic probably 32000 the 49ers do. So we're in a big battle again to get the bills paid, but I have had uh, up till now most of my bills paid for um, through um, uh, work comp. I have another question. Um, well, first I have to ask, did you just have a birthday recently, George? You know, uh, I'm looking at my watch. Today's the 27th. Yes, it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Someone actually knew and, and wanted to wish you a happy belated birthday, and, and I wish you a happy belated birthday, too. That was one of the things that came in on the question, so I just wanted to share that. Um, so well, happy belated birthday. <laughs> um, I have another question here about the neurogenesis. Um, this individual wants to know, do you mean the theory of or the actual process? If so, how do you know it's happening? Um, I guess they wanted clarification on dendrites growing versus neurons growing. They, they have done scientific studies. They have these new um, high-tech, oh gosh darn it, these new scans. I'm trying to think the name of it. It's like a fMRI. It'll, it'll actually track... Um, neurons, you get a picture of a, just a big, it's like a ball of, of strings going everywhere. Um, and so they can actually track growth of new neurons um, moving through the brain. So this isn't just subjective stuff. This, these are some of the things I think that they have, I mean, not think that from what are I've Are they read, DTI scans, George? DTI I'm sorry? Scans? Um, are they called DTI scans? You know what, I, I think they are. Brain or... or transfusion something or you, you might be you might be right yeah one of the attendees just uh, typed that in so I wanted to ask okay. diffusion tensor uh, diffusion tensor imaging that's exactly it thank you um, I have uh, let's see two more questions uh, one question I have is how many years um, have you been married? And what are some strategies you do? I know you mentioned that it's, it's been tough with your family. Do you have strategies as a couple? Um, what do you do when, you know, I know you said you had mood swings. Is there any coping, you know, strategies that you use or anything uh, to help deal with that particularly? Yeah, I've been married for, um, I think it's been 18 years. And for the first many, many, many years, you know, to me, it was, it was my wife was just hypersensitive, that I was normal, you know. And then over the years now, um, she asked me to go to counseling years and years ago. And I said, oh, we don't need counseling. I'm no different than anyone else. Well, you know what? I am different. And so there are some things. I have a lot of work to do with my poor wife. Um, uh, by, uh, thank God, and she's hung in there. Uh, we've come up with things like uh, I've told her to when I start to get kind of, because I'm a very emotional person anyway. Football is a, is a very emotional game. Um, I'm half Lebanese. We're like the Italians. You know, when I'm talking, my hands are flying all over. And, you know, you get the facial expressions going. So I can be intimidating. 
And so I've told her that at times if I start to get a little worked up in a conversation, she'll come up with, uh, we have a couple little sayings that, little stupid things that will make me step back and think, and, it, and it's, a, it's a little, it's like, hey, George, chill out, you know, you're getting out of control. So we have little things like that that um, I try to follow. Um, we have things like, uh, boy, I used to do about an hour, 15 minute, hour and a half commute to my office every day. And one of my older brothers was a football coach for years and he used to tell me, um, he says, hey, he goes, remember when you're going home, they're on your team because, you know, I'm driving home and all these things are going through my mind and I'm getting all worked up about, and not, not what my family has done, but I walk in the door and I'm, I'm you know, a beast. So I have to conscientiously try to, like, diffuse what's going on in my mind um, and remember that it's not that important and try to focus on the things that are important. But having little, like, the little, you know, ticklers that my wife will give me, like, hey, you know, her little words that she'll drop, it'll make me step back and open my eyes that I need to just kind of relax. So, and we're, st I'm still working on a lot of things. I have a lot of work to do there. Um, but if you know of any other techniques, please forward on to me. All right. It looks like we have two more questions here. Um, one has to do with the recent settlement between the NFL um, and players who have sustained brain injuries while involved with the league. What are your thoughts about that? Um, and do players receive ongoing education and have the tools they need to minimize the risk of TBI while playing the game? So um, I guess the first question the second, would be, what are your thoughts? Okay, my thoughts on, the, on that uh, settlement. When it first came out, whenever it was, a week or two, three weeks ago, and you look at that $765 million, and everyone's going, wow. And, but that's paid out over 20 years. Now, keep in mind, the NFL grossed $9.5 billion last year, billion with a B. And when I do my talks, I tell people, a million dollars in $100 bills is a block three feet long, two feet tall, and two feet wide. That's a million. One billion would fill a room 16 feet long, 10 feet wide, and nine feet tall. That's one billion and go up nine and a half stories of hundred dollar bills. That's what they made last year. So what they're offering, and then, and then it's going to be paid out, this 765 million will be paid out over 20 years. Now if they don't even increase their revenue, which they expect to increase their NFL revenue, but to 25 billion a year by the 20 year payout period, even if they don't increase it, they will make hundred and ninety billion dollars during the payout period of which our payment will be 0.0000004 of 1% of what they've grossed in that time period. So no, it, it's a sham. It, it was just a, a, a stall tactic so they could get this season going um, it, with the NFL. And, and you look at Roger Goodell, the president of the NFL, or the guy makes $30 million a year. 30. And they can't find, I crunched numbers for them last year. I said, take one half of 1% of your gross. That was $247 million, And just put that in a, in, a, in a retirement fund for guys. Every year, put half a percent. Can they do that? No. And so it, 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 is, it is sinful what they're doing. They have destroyed families. You know, we just had another, um, we had a suicide yesterday, I saw. A 29-year-old kid. Uh, was with, um, doggone it, San Diego Chargers just killed himself. We have NFL players have about a uh, 400 times higher rate of suicide. We have an 800 times higher rate uh, of getting ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, four to 500 times higher rate of dementia. You know, it, it's ridiculous. They know what their, what their industry is doing to their employees. And for the love of money, they continue to turn their head. And then on the second question, I think it was, is, are there programs for guys? Or what was education, the second question? Education. And I mean, I know from my um, experience that, I mean, regardless of, of the kind of helmets they use, there's no helmet that can prevent concussion. Um, exactly. You know, so it is really, there's not a whole lot that we could do without changing the culture. 
Um, and I don't know if you agree with that, George. You know what? You, you nail. I, I use those exact same terms, Carla, honestly. We need to change the culture of the game. The foot, football has evolved from in the old days where you tried to outscore your opponent to now to just you try to blow them up. When I was, when I was playing, okay, you watch some of these defensive backs and some, the way these guys tackle nowadays, they don't even wrap their arms around Receivers coming down with the ball, they come flying and they plant both their feet and they just launch themselves into guys. Now, they would always jump our butts for not wrapping up and grabbing hold of a jersey. They don't even do that now. It's all about just, just trying to lay guys out. Um, so the culture of the game needs to change. The culture of the game where you need to suck it up and play with injuries. You know, um, We need to get away from that. People have lost sight that this is just a game. It's not a life or death situation. It's not a socially redeeming industry. I mean, for crying out loud, and, and guys are destroying not just their lives, their families' lives. And so we need to change the whole culture of the game. Get this, this head hunter, head killing uh, aspect out. I have a, one of the wristbands that, that we sell on our, on our um, uh, website. We have two of them. Like I said, one is short, choppy steps. The other one is use your head, and then in big letters and capital it says don't use your head. We need to quit using the human brain as a weapon to deliver blows. Um, so uh, I, I think I maybe got off track there. I can't remember. No, but, I, I um, think I, you're 100% right. And we had a few more questions that had to do okay. with do you think the sport of football will change and um, someone stating that the culture of the fans has to change as well. And I 100% I agree. Will the sport of football change? Um, I think if more people like George um, come out and share their stories and share their experiences, I think we're on the right track. Is there a lot of work to be done? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. But I think what George is doing today is the first step, getting the message out, telling people, you know, these, these can be some of the consequences of, you know, playing this way or of using our body this way. Um, and, and just making people aware of what can happen. Um, so I think only time will tell. Uh, I don't know if you agree, George, but I do think we're, um, we're, we're on the right track. More people are aware than have been in the past, um, but there still is a lot of work to be done. Carla, I agree with you 100%. Um, you nailed it. We, we are, uh, it's been hard for guys to step forward and talk, talk about what's going on. If some of, if some of you out there want to see what happens, I, when I was down here, I was speaking in Southern Cal last year to the International Hyperbaric Association's annual conference. They asked me to present at their dinner. And while I'm down in Southern Cal, in Long Beach, for years I've been trying to track down one of my 49er roommates, okay, Terry Totolo. Great, great man, great family guy. I tracked him down last summer. He had played nine years in the NFL. I find him living homeless under an underpass down here. Lost his wife, lost his family, lost his home. He can't. He can't think straight. Um, and, and these are guys that are out there. When the, when the NFL is done, they just throw you to the sidelines like a piece of rotten meat. And people need to see these stories and hear about them. So I've been, I've hooked up with Terry now this last year, and we're we've got him in living with his daughter now, and, and we're working with him trying to get him back on his feet. But there are thousands of guys like that out there, and not just professional players. You know, college players, um, they are finding CTE, chronic traumatic encephalophily, which is, can only be diagnosed post-mortem. They're finding it now in high school kids. Absolutely. So, and I know I've the, seen some cases discussed about that as well, you know, as early as, you know, a 19-year-old um, who had taken his life, and he had shown signs of it as well. So um, we're really just starting to, to learn more about this. Exactly. And then just in the paper today or yesterday, I had a link uh, uh, a high school kid, uh, I can't remember where, uh, died in a game. Got his bell rung, you know, as they say. He got up, you know, walked off the sidelines, and then collapsed and died of a brain hemorrhage during surgery. So, um, again, we, we, we lose sight of this just a game. Is it worth crippling yourself or, or, or losing your mind or your life? We need to step back. And, and until the fans, you know, because the fans, you see, when I speak about this, I catch nothing but guff from most fans, that I'm trying to sissify the game. 
I'm trying to save people's lives and, 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 and prevent families from going through what my family has gone through for 30-something years. But until the fans, that's a good point, really step back and so you say, you know what, I'm not going to pay $85 for a ticket, $35 for parking, $12 for a hot dog, you know, $6 for a Coke, and support what these billionaire owners are doing to these young guys. It's never going to happen. George, we're, um, we're out of time. The, the one last question, um, and I think you, you kind of answered this before, is if your kids wanted to play football or other contact sports, would you let them after everything you've been through or after no. everything you've been through? No, my son was chomping a bit. And you've got to keep in mind, he's heard all the stories of me playing and all the great stories. And uh, I was all for him playing. But uh, my, I fought my wife. I said, no, he won't play in Pop Warner. When he gets into high school, my greatest times in my life. And then after my first visit at Dr. Amon's clinic, uh, we were down here for three days, and I had my wife and my son with us. Jack was nine at the time. And after th three days of evaluations, we walked out of the, his, his clinic, and we didn't even get to the truck. And Chrissy said, Jack will never play football. And he looked up at me, and I said, buddy, I can't argue with your mom. And so unless they change this game, I don't know who's going to be letting their, their kids play. Um, they need to change it, and I'm not quite sure how you can do that. Well, thank you, George. That concludes our webinar presentation. I want to thank uh, George again. Uh, it's, it was really a pleasure to hear uh, you speak today, and I know that uh, everyone that attended probably feels the same. It's just great to hear you share your experience, and uh, it's very courageous. So thank you. Um, please visit uh, www.biaNYS.org. Please visit George's site, www.theviscergroup.org. Um, I, I think that it's great what he's doing, um, and I applaud him for his efforts. And I want to thank you all for participating, and I hope everyone has an absolutely wonderful day. Enjoy. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Carla. Thank you, George. Have a good one. You too.